Welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for taking the time to attend this afternoon. Again, my name is Bruce Murray-Waltz. Um, as Bill can know, it's Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory here in Ann Arbor. Um, and I'm also happy for, for one of the first times to, to wear an additional hat today. Um, I also have an adjunct appointment in the University of Michigan School of um, uh, Civil and Environmental Engineering, Department of Environmental Engineering, in the Environmental Water Resources Engineering group. So today, I'm going to start off talking a little bit about some context issues for the Great Lakes, uh, hitting on some of the main reasons we look toward it as a, as a benchmark for hydrological research. And then we'll talk about Great Lakes water level dynamics and some of the key drivers behind those dynamics across a variety of space time scales. And then finally, we go through a little bit of discussion on regional collaborative modeling and forecasting research. So to start off with, those of us who, who live and work here in the Great Lakes recognize the flora of a broad range of features, their natural beauty, their source of drinking water, the fact that more than 40 million people live in the basin. But there are two key features of the Great Lakes Basin that I want to leave you with today. And the first one echoes what Alan just pointed out a moment ago, which is that they have a massive coastline. If you look at this particular image, which summarizes the length of coastline of the major U.S. coastline, we see that the Great Lakes has one of the longest. Total U.S. miles of coastline is 4,500 miles. You see the Atlantic coastline is around 4,200 miles. The Gulf of Mexico around 1,600, and the Pacific roughly 1,500. Only Alaska has more than 6,300 miles. But when you look at the United States and the Canadian coastlines put together, we have roughly 10,000 miles of coastline. And when it comes to fresh water inland coastlines, nothing else on the planet comes close. In fact, more importantly. When you look at the Great Lakes coastline, we're talking about an order of magnitude of the coastline that is comparable to what's on a lot of the marine coastlines right now. They're getting a lot of attention for sea level rise, coastal inundation. There's an awful lot we can probably learn about what we deal with here in the Great Lakes in terms of coastal water level dynamics that can be applied to these other marine coasts. The second take home message regarding magnitude, I think more of a global perspective in terms of where water is, as Alan was talking about earlier. We can look here and we can see some of these major water bodies on the planet. We can see the Great Lakes of the North American Water Chain Great Lakes. We can see the Aspen Great Lakes. We can even see Lake Baikal and, of course, the Caspian Sea's Black Sea show up. When we take a look at these lakes in tabular form, what I have here are the highest ranking surface area water bodies or fresh water bodies on the planet. In this left column here, right here I have the name of the fresh water body, the country it resides in. And then we have its surface area expressed both in terms of kilometers squared and miles squared. And then this last column here has volume expressed both in cubic kilometers and cubic miles. And when we highlight those water bodies that constitute the Great Lakes, we see some interesting figures and interesting patterns. One of which is that when it comes to surface area of fresh water, Lake Superior stands alone. It is the largest freshwater surface body on the planet. Now, I have Michigan and Huron lumped together here. Individually, they have the smallest surface area in Superior, but we also lump them together from a long-term hydrological modeling and monitoring perspective because they're joined at the Strait of Magellan. Now, from a water volume perspective, it is indeed true that Lake Baikal has the largest volume of any fresh surface water on the planet, and that is an individual lake, Lake Tanganyika, is not far behind. But collectively, the Great Lakes actually have a volume that is very close to that of Lake Baikal. But here's another perspective on this. In the entire world, there are about 90,000 cubic kilometers of fresh surface water. As Alan mentioned earlier, the Great Lakes constitute about 20% of that. About half of that resides in Lake Antonica, Lake Baikal, and the North American Great Lakes. So when you consider the amount of monitoring infrastructure, the amount of research investments that are made in the Great Lakes, even further underscores the role and the place at the table that the Great Lakes really need to have in terms of global water resources, if not in the context of global water scarcity. So, a few take home messages here from the introductory report when I talk regarding the Great Lakes. They're the largest unfrozen fresh surface water on the planet by surface area, second largest by volume. They have a massive population, more than 40 million people reside in the basin, diverse ecosystems, and a large economy, well, we'll look at that in my colleagues will talk about later on. Interestingly, they're collectively managed uh, by two different nations. And I have utilized by two different nations here, but in fact, they're utilized not just by two countries, but more specifically, eight different states, several tribal nations, and also two different Canadian provinces. This has important implications for 
largest waterfront source, the source for largest waterfront observation, we're looking at more of NOAA's National Ocean Service water level gauging station. That's going to be the one back in our city. So here's a gauge uh, housing station. The gauging from this side here is actually some instrumentation on here, also for weather observation. But the key points here are that there are 53 of these owned and operated by NOAA on the U.S. side of the Great Lakes coastline. There are more than not that many owned and operated on the Canadian side of the border. And collectively, all those gauge locations that form what we refer to as the, the lake level monitoring network. And that's the source of information for a lot of the lake level information you can see over by pockets the next few times. Now, when we talk about water level dynamics, we typically divide it into three space and time scales. The first one has to do with short time scales. That is, Water level fluctuations that take place over the course of, of minutes, hours, perhaps even days. The focus of my talk today is going to be more on the mid and long term dynamics, those that take place over the course of months, seasons, years, and even decades. And when it comes to the drivers of water level over those time scales, we really focus primarily on the water budget that is, the amount of water that's coming into and the amount of water that's leaving. Great Lakes Basin. So in this particular image, which was taken from US EPA's Great Lakes Atlas, we have a, a boundary drawn around the Great Lakes Basin. And then we have a series of arrows here, all of them representing the flow of water either into or out of the basin. So for example, these yellow arrows you see here represent very small diversion of water into the basin, and this arrow here represents the flow of water out of the basin. But then the major arrows in this picture represent the, what we call the major components of the water budget. On each one of these lakes, you see a series of arrows, and they include, if I use Lake Superior as an example, this green arrow represents runoff that goes into the lake. The middle orange arrow represents precipitation that falls directly onto the lake surface. And this third arrow represents evaporation on the lake surface. And in each one of these cases, the width of those arrows is roughly proportional to the magnitude of that component of the water budget. Okay, and those three components I just outlined, overlay precipitation, overlay evacuation, and runoff, constitute what we refer to as the head basin supply, and that supply of water into each basin. Now, a couple of take-home methods from this slide. One is that the Great Lakes Basin is not only massive, but it is covered by roughly one-third one -third of its surface area is surface water. There are very few basins, if any, on the planet that have that same feature. One of the consequences of that is that overlake evaporation, overlake precipitation, and runoff are roughly of the same orders of magnitude. However, overlake precipitation and overlake evaporation are very difficult to measure. In fact, it was only in roughly 2007 to 2008 when we first began to take evaporation measurements off of the lakes, and those were only from pure Earth. There's some pioneering research led by Peter Blank at the University of Colorado Boulder and Chris Stent um, from Hyman Canada, as well as John Ledger from the University of Nebraska Lincoln. And in fact, some of that research support was provided by Lisa here at the university and also from the IJC through the International Club of Great Lakes Study. There are now six evaporation stations distributed throughout the Great Lakes. We view it as a major research priority to continue maintaining those gauges collecting information from them real time, and perhaps even expanding that network over time so we can just get a better understanding of what's happening with the power of loss over the Great Lakes. Okay. Now, there are other, um, actually, this slide indicates that uh, there's a lot of work being done to try to develop a better understanding of these major components of the water budget. Um, there's a series of papers that, that focus on that. These, these first two focus on understanding, uh, better understanding the precipitation dynamics. This middle one here is the paper that Chris Spence and his colleagues used to publish some of the evaporation results from Lake Superior. And then these last three uh, represent uh, papers that try to move that, the runoff to the entire Great Lakes basin. Now, 
response to the relief is pressure falling over the tree of glaciers from the last ice age. And this picture actually shows the vertical rate of velocity, or the vertical velocity of the land surface in response to that relief of pressure. So what we're seeing here is that relative to this narrow contour line that goes to the middle of the lakes, the North Shore of Georgian Bay and Lake Superior is literally rising at a rate of roughly 30 to 40 centimeters per century. And that may not sound like a lot, but in geologic time, the time frames we're referring to in the Great Lakes, it's actually quite a bit. And in fact, to put it even more explicitly, relative to Chicago or the south shore of Lake Michigan, that tilting is actually close to more on the order of 50 centimeters per century. When you think about a lot of the infrastructure that was built in Georgian Bay on the North Shore of Lake Huron, that was built 50 to 100 years ago, isostatic makeup provides an explanation for a lot of what we're seeing in terms of the, the retreat of water from the shoreline, coupled with a lot of the changes in the surface water elevation that's going on there. So let's dive into taking a look at some, some of this data we're talking about with regards to the drivers of, of Great Lakes water flow. And what we're looking at here is a snapshot from a tool that we recently created to help better visualize water level and water budget data. This is Great Lakes Water Level and Now Converted Hydroclimate Dashboard. This was developed in partnership with SILAC, with funding from the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative through EPA. The program was developed at Joe Smith is here in the crowd, and he'll be doing a demonstration afterwards. Now there are a lot of features on this dashboard. Um, but what, some of the ones I want to highlight for you here are the fact that we have several different panels. We have three different panels. So you can see the case the top panel represents Lake Superior, the middle of Michigan here on at the bottom, Lake Erie, and we can turn them on or off using a series of toggles, which is in the upper right hand corner here. And then within each one of those panels, there are two different axes. On the right hand axis here, I have millimeters of water, or equivalent of millimeters of water, over the surface of the lake for any different component that we choose, whether it's precipitation or evaporation or runoff. I'll get to that in a second. On the left hand axis over here, we have meters. This is an elevation. So this is surface water elevation in meters. And it's just off the screen here, I think. But those are measured against a benchmark known as the IGLD, or the International Great Lakes Data. It's a reference point against which all of the elevations of Great Lakes water level measurements are made. The reason we have to have a unique data for the Great Lakes is because of isostatic makeup. So we need to accommodate for that limitation. Every 30 years or so, that data is updated. So the last one was done in 1985, and we're preparing to do another one shortly. Okay. In terms of the data, what we're looking at here is we are looking at annual precipitation values over each one of the lakes, Superior, Michigan, Huron, and Erie, going back to about 1900. And what we see here are some interesting values. Over Lake Superior, we see precipitation. Oh, and by the way, these vertical bars are structured in a way such that the pink or reddish vertical bars represent annual totals that are below the long-term average, whereas the green bars represent precipitation amounts that are above the long-term average. Okay. So what we see here is that Lake Superior precipitation amounts have gone up and down, but really since the 1980s, they have tended to de decrease or tended to go toward below average values. Okay. Interestingly, on Michigan, Huron, and Erie, you can see, based on the increased uh, curves of these green bars, precipitation amounts have actually, uh, actually had a tendency to be above their long-term average over the past 20, 30 years on these lake surfaces. Using this dashboard tool, we can actually um, go over on the right-hand menu here, and we can click on a different category, looking at water level observations, and choose from those very, very different data sets. We can look at long-term annual average water levels, and well, we see some interesting trends here. What we find in general is that up until the past 15, 20 years or so, Great Lakes water levels have largely followed long-term changes in precipitation. Okay? So, for example, if you look here on Lake Superior over the past 20, 30 years, there's actually been a decreasing trend in precipitation, and the, the water levels that follow that, also on Michigan Huron, following some of the lowest water levels uh, we've ever had in the uh, early 1960s, there was a period where precipitation rates tended to go above average until the point we reached the um, all-time high on Michigan Huron in 1986. Now, the 
precipitation patterns explain a lot of the variability that we see here. But one thing that they do not explain is what happened in the late 1990s when the water levels dropped all the distance, including Lake Superior, even though it's regulated by College of Maryland, we'll talk about it in a few minutes. All of them dropped, in fact, Michigan Huron dropped about a meter over the course of two to three years, despite the fact that we don't really see a remarkable shift in precipitation during that time period. So what I want to bring up next is another component of the water budget, evaporation. And let's take a look at how that compares to what's been happening with annual water levels. So what we see here are, these are model derived estimates of evaporation. As I mentioned earlier, only within the past five years did we have any measurement of evaporation from portions of the lake surface. So these are model derived estimates. Nonetheless, what we believe has been happening is that in the late 1990s, there was a remarkable shift in evaporation that largely led to almost a different regime driving long-term water levels, and that is coupled largely with a feedback between changes in surface water temperature and ice cover. So putting more explicitly, when you look at the data, you'll see that in the late 1990s, the surface water temperature of Lake Superior jumped by about 2 degrees Celsius on an annual average basis over the course of just a few years. That is a remarkable change. A lot of that um, is expressed here in our understanding of, that, of evaporation. So, what are some of the take home messages from this part of the talk? So, water levels on Lake Superior, Michigan, and Huron are and have been for the past 15 years below their long term average. Um, but interestingly, um, also Lake Michigan and Huron, as my colleagues will probably talk about in a moment, they recently hit not just um, all time lows for the month of December, but also all time lows across the entire year. But water levels on Lake Erie and Lake Ontario have been hovering right around the long-term average um, for quite a long time, particularly with Lake Ontario. And then the last point I want to make that, that really segues into the next portion of my talk is how can we take our understanding of these water budget components, in particular forecast water budget components, and propagate those into forecast um, water budgets? And that's a major research question that we work on, particularly with the Army Water Research and Population Stream. And that's what I'm going to talk about. So, as I mentioned earlier, we talked about water levels on a variety of space, time, and scale, but the one I want to focus on here is looking at seasonal water variation, in particular seasonal water level modeling. So, what I have here is another view of the water level dashboard, but what I've done instead of showing water levels, what I'm showing is from 1997 up until the present, all of the forecasts that were made using one of several forecasting tools that are used here in the basin. This one happens to have been developed at NOAA as the Advanced Hydrologic Prediction System, or ACAS. And what I'm showing here are all of the predictions that were made for each of these months that were made six months prior to that month. And these vertical gray bars are what we call prediction ratios. They're actually 95% prediction ratios. That means that we expect about 95% of these uh, intervals to contain the, the true or observed Water so here we have six months ahead uh, predictions. In blue, we have three months ahead predictions. As you can see, there's a, there's a difference. The blue bar is a little bit narrower. We have more information as we get closer to the actual month that the forecast is for. And then on top of this, I can overlay in light blue the actual observed water levels for each one of those months, as well as in red the long term average water level. And there's an awful lot we can learn retrospective on scale assessment. What we learned is that this particular model that's been used to conduct the research on did surprisingly well in the late 1990s. And in particular, Michigan Huron here, when water levels dropped by about a meter over those two to three years, um, this model was able to capture those dynamics. And a lot of the research that we did on this is summarized in a paper we published in 2011 in the Journal of Great Lakes Research. It did an appraisal of the data since then. But we also think this type of retrospective scale assessment is important because we learn about why our models fail. In this particular case, our models essentially failed on Lake Erie in 2011 and 2012. And here's what happened. In the spring of 2011, water levels on Lake Erie jumped by almost a meter four months. That was the largest spring rise on Lake Erie ever in recorded history. A 
model did not anticipate that run, largely because of how we propagate precipitation into the model, but it also simply is an unprecedented event. It's also coupled, by the way, with the record setting on the level of nature the next year, another ecosystem response. What is absolutely fascinating about that run to me is that it was followed in the year immediately after, right here in December, by a jump in water level in December, which usually never happens. And then a 10 month continuous decline in water level for a year. Again, that has never happened before in our entire recorded history of Lake Erie. But typically, Lake Erie water levels have almost always risen at least during one of the spring months, if not several in a row. Not during any one of the spring months in 2012 did, did Lake Erie rise to back to back unprecedented water levels. These are water level dynamics that occurred in that time period. So we took a closer look at this, and um, there are some interesting things going on in the basin. What this slide shows just for Lake Erie is the month to month water level change over the historical record. So in this particular panel on the left here, what we have is I have 160 or so vertical bars, one for each year. So for example, on the far left is in 1860, the water level change from October to November in that year. So we have month to month water level changes. So in that first panel, what we see is that pretty much you can almost, you're almost guarantee that you know, from October to November, water levels go down just about a tenth of a meter. And the black line put in here is a trend line. It is a trend over the period of record. So what we see here that's interesting is that there is an increased mutancy right now. If you look at these black lines and the orientation of some of these blue and red lines, there is an increasing tendency for water levels to rise in the winter time on Lake Erie, and there is an increasing tendency in the late spring for them to go down. Look at May Lake here, and look how many blue bars there are here and how many red bars there are there starting with heat waves in May. What this represents essentially is a shift in the water flow. Water is coming down, precipitation is falling more as rain, and it wasn't so bad that the water levels were rising more in the wintertime. The boundary of the waters are higher, and we're starting to see water levels dropping earlier and earlier into the season. And this is something that we need to keep track of, not just in the Erie, but across the entire basin. So I mention this because sort of to, to wrap things up, Water levels are important. We're going to learn a lot about why our water levels are important today. But I also think that one of the key things we can keep our eye on are the drivers of water levels. The changes in the water budget and how those are affecting not just water levels, but a wide range of ecosystems and human health factors, not the least of which are microalgal blooms, as was summarized by many folks in this room in the United paper that was just recently published. So, to wrap things up, we're currently in a state of low water levels on Lake Superior, Michigan, and Huron, and there's some important ecosystem, e economic and ecosystem impacts associated with that. Um, but there's lots of variability also in our understanding of our future condition. Most of our uncertainty and variability in future water level is a reflection of the fact that we are uncertain, in a lot of cases, about the drive of the water levels in the future. It's hard to predict precipitation two to five years, let alone 10, 20, 50 years from now. But those are the key drivers of water levels we are hard to predict. This leads us to some interesting research questions, one of which is, are the lessons that we're learning here about the Great Lakes transferable to other water systems? And I believe that they are. But there are a lot of editors of some of the leading journals that believe that the Great Lakes are broken, that they may in fact be too unique or too big for the lessons we learned here to be trans transferred to other basins. But I think we have an opportunity to transfer some of these lessons and, and, and do things on a global water resources scale. And finally, a question that I'm hoping Michael Moore might provide some insight to has to do with what is the value of the Great Lakes? Can we increase their value without turning them into a commodity? And the implicit question in there is what is the value of the research, 